quickly, and this is something of value, let's very quickly just sort of identify some of the weak points. Number one, taxation. There is none. They, they cannot tax. I mean, there's no other way to say that. Number two, there is no executive. Under the Articles of Confederation, there was a Congress. And if you're thinking, and, and again, this is the type of thing they're probably going to ask as a question. Some of you who have trouble in the multiple choice, you go with, there is no executive. There is no executive. But what is the question going to ask? Something more about why. The question is going to reference something about being afraid of the king. Because of the king, remember the declaration was directed towards King George? That is the reflection of why they didn't have an executive. Number three, the amendment process side. Does anybody remember what was the prior problem? It's unanimous. And folks, the best example I can give is imagine grab 13 of your friends, take them out to dinner, and say you all have to order exactly the same thing. Seriously, I, I want you to think how easy that would be. I have the feeling you'd run into conflict, even if it was something like pizza. You know, is everybody going to want the same topping? Do you all like thick crust? And imagine trying to get them to all order the same drink. Okay? I guarantee if it's in this class, we're all drinking Coca-Cola. But um, other than the fact of having Cleveland the dictator, number four is the states have too much power. Basically, the federal government had no ability to intervene in state matters. Um, basically, the states could do whatever they want. If the states do not agree with the federal government, they can simply sort of thumb their nose and say, we're not doing it. And that's a problem. Number five, this again was kind of an oversight. There was no regulation of commerce. You know, so the ability to trade, and of course what happens, if you have one unified country, and Massachusetts has this policy, and Rhode Island, what happens is the colonies begin to compete against each other, and that becomes very adversarial. That's not good. The quorum process. And folks, quorum is not a bad thing. And I don't want you to go like to Mr. Cruz and say, we shouldn't have a quorum. No, a quorum's fine, but it should be for something like voting. Because otherwise, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia could have got together and passed, you know, everybody has to have a slave, you know, ordinances. The idea was, is the quorum process literally says, if there wasn't nine, Congress dissolves. And just like today with the stupidity of a filibuster, you know, you get up and read the dictionary, states learn that if they don't like the topic, you get a couple of other states to stand up, walk out, and the Congress literally dissolves. When you go over it, Yes, there's probably some others. Those would be the big ones. If you look at successes of the articles, very simply, the American Revolution, the American Revolution, the American Revolution, the American Revolution. That is the one people have a tendency to forget. This is the government that won the war. Number two, most of you could define the Land Act and the Northwest Ordinance. Where a lot of you guys screw up is what does that pertain to? They figured out what to do with the Northwest land. They figured out what to do with the Western territory. So originally, this was a problem. We had all that land. Remember, that's why Maryland didn't ratify. This was a problem that they actually fixed. That's what I'm trying to get at. In that case, what I'd like to look at now is more of specific items. Um, one of them we've already covered, and that is Shea. Um, if no one has questions, I will just say Shea's Rebellion, and you can look back. Um, if you have questions, definitely you want to look at it. The first item I want to look at, some of you may remember, because I know I probably mentioned it last year, is a court case called Trevitt versus Whedon. Now, as I say that, I do want to point out, under the articles, there is no American Supreme Court, so this would be like a, it's Rhode Island court case. Folks, and I know this is for some of you who have never really thought about paper money. Um, at this time in history, what people were familiar with in London is, yes, if you had paper money, it was more of a convenience. But paper money, historically, was what was called a certificate. In fact, if any of you have ever seen paper money where the, the, the writing kind of has bright blue or bright red, those were old money that were certificates, and they guaranteed you silver or gold. In the old days, paper money was simply a convenience, but the money represented gold. During the Revolution, we printed paper. We didn't have enough gold, so we printed it. In the case of Trevitt versus Wheaton, remember the life, liberty, property, that whole property, property, property? The question was, if I, if I sell kittens, that just kept popping in my head, do I have to sell my kitten, which is property, right, and take paper crap? If I don't think the paper's worth anything, do I have to take it? In the case of Trevitt versus Wheaton, 
the Rhode Island Supreme Court basically says, think how much this would be a problem. Paper money is inherently worthless, and you can't make a person take it. So even though the government issued it, even though the government handed it out, all of a sudden it is announced, it can't be enforced. So if you own a business, you can say no. And that's kind of, because if you think now ahead, remember we talked about Shays? That's kind of where the problems came with money, because the paper money that people had been paid and given, nobody wanted, yet you were being expected to pay taxes, and that's where the difficulty came. Did, did I say how many types of money there were? 14, because the Congress made paper crap, every state made paper crap, and where the problem came in is some states continued to make money that was only backed by gold, right? Other places made the paper. If you were a state that had money backed by gold, would you want to exchange your money for that other paper crap? That's where the problem came in. If, the, if we would have had one type of paper money, clearly what you're saying would have made more sense. The problem was is we had these very different types of paper, and the states that had paper that was still backed by gold, they did not want to accept the other paper. The next item, you can simply call it Mount Vernon or the Mount Vernon meeting. Does anybody know what Mount Vernon is? All right, so first of all, this is in Virginia. It is George Washington's house. The Mount Vernon meeting is actually just Virginia and Maryland. So it's just two states. Again, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. Maybe you all are. Here's Virginia, here's Maryland, and right between them, their border, is the Potomac River. Are everybody okay with that? Folks, the question was, who controlled it? Of course, Maryland said what? We do. Virginia said what? And what did I just tell you under the articles? Congress had no authority, right? At Mount Vernon, these two states came together to try to work out how do we use the, the river? How do we share the river or who gets the river? And from that, they began to realize that, you know, that there was a lot of questions with the articles. So the big thing about Mount Vernon is they are talking about a, a problem specific to the two states. The Mount Vernon meeting ends up proposing what is called the Annapolis Convention. The Annapolis Convention of 1786 is the first meeting, it is the first gathering for one purpose, to look at the Articles of Confederation. You know, the Articles of Confederation at this time is, what, nine years old? And some states were beginning to feel that the Articles had problems. Some states were beginning to feel that we, maybe we needed to make modifications. So we have the Annapolis meeting. And let's just check our, our geography. Where is Annapolis? It is in Maryland. That makes sense because those are the two states. Everybody is invited to Maryland. And we are looking at the Articles. Ladies and gentlemen, the big thing, if you want to make kind of like a quick hint, very few states attended. I believe it's either six or seven. And most of the people who showed up were the very angry people, the people who really hated the articles, the people who wanted radical change. Okay. The most humorous thing of all, I, again, I, I've got that sarcasm to me, Maryland did not show up. I find that to be amazing. Called the meeting, it's in their state, and nobody bothered to open the door and say we're here. I mean, it, it's just mind boggling. What you want to point out is when we bring up an app, it's one of those situations, like think about maybe Elkhorn High School. People would probably, you know what, it's not perfect. Maybe they would complain, but it seemed to be working good enough. Most people liked the autonomy of their individual state. And in all of honesty, what does Annapolis show? Nobody felt that there was a dire necessity. The only thing that they come up with is they organize a second meeting. So they are gonna try once again to get everybody to show up. The second meeting is the Philadelphia Convention, 1787, which is more commonly called the Constitutional Convention. What is the single most important thing? Annapolis, nothing should change, right? In between them. Ladies and gentlemen, really the key item, because I think that's the question over here, what causes them is, so literally we have Annapolis, and then 
in the time that we are waiting for Philadelphia, Shays Rebellion happens. It is largely Shays Rebellion that kind of puts that legitimate fear, that much more slap in the face of, okay, that could have been scary. I mean, literally, Massachusetts almost had a situation. They were overthrown by this group of renegades, and there was very little, you know, the federal government had very little ability to interact. Is that really what we want, where the 13 counties or the 13 states are constantly going through upheaval? We would be like, honestly, third world countries where if someone is unhappy, you simply revolt, you kill the leaders, and you start a new government. Most of you are probably smart enough to figure out that this is the one that matters because I already told you it's called the Constitutional Convention. That probably should give you the hint of what's going to happen here. Make no mistake, this is where you see all the famous people. I mean, you know, all of those founding fathers you've all heard of, they are here. The presiding officer will be George Washington, and really this is where you begin to see Washington taking the position of kind of the leader. Um, when you talk about George Washington, we'll talk about him more when he becomes president. Washington is not a very vocal man. Washington, I mean, Jefferson, Hamilton, Madison, they were the talkers and the thinkers. George Washington with this man, and yes, he was tall. He was over six foot two, six foot three. At this time in history, that was exceptionally big. Washington is a very quiet man, and folks, a lot of you in this room want to be or should become leaders. You are supposed to be you know, the top of your class. Washington, what you want to understand is he would sit and listen to everything. And where was his power? When Washington would speak, he demanded the absolute most utmost attention because he did not sp speak very often. He had a huge amount of respect. He was the great war hero. And he very much kind of refrained his words. He would only speak, and oftentimes, especially when we would get down to like a squabble or a controversy, he would kind of be that final last, you know, we need to move forward. There is other people who do the fighting. Twelve states show up, one state never goes. Anybody know what that is? There is the pain in the butt. Ladies and gentlemen, Rhode Island is going to be an absolute nuisance. Yeah, you could probably argue that it's because of Rhode Island that we really are going to have to go away from the articles. Because remember, in order to deal with change the articles, what do we know you need? 13 out of 13. Does anybody know why will Rhode Island absolutely refuse to go? They're small, small states, so they're worried that they're going to get like, overrun. What? Rhode Island is absolutely sure that what is the issue that is going that, that, that this is all about? And Rhode Island absolutely believes who is behind all this crap. What state is doing it? Virginia. And Rhode Island's like, no, no. Virginia doesn't always get what she wants. They don't get to bully everybody. And Rhode Island's honest opinion is, if we don't show up, you have to come begging to us. The old man is we simply throw out the articles and you start over. If, I, if you didn't catch it from what I just said, most of the states that show up are coming to argue and fight, and really they're only thinking about what? Exactly. So as everybody gets to Philadelphia, it becomes kind of this yelling, arguing, divided mess, and that's kind of what your point was, because everybody is thinking about what would be good. Are we big? Are we small? Are we farm? Are we industry? Do we have slaves? Do we not? And it's yell, 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 yell. And honest to goodness, I mean, it, 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 when you go to Miss Randall, I know she's a huge supporter. Ladies and gentlemen, when you look at the Constitution, when you look at what is about to happen, really what saves the day is one man. Everybody else came to fight and simply say, we should do what's best for us. Okay? One man went back and, and looked at, you know, like he looked at Rome, he looked at Greece, he, he gathered information, and he looked at... What would a government look like? How could you make a government that would balance the big and the small? How would you make a government where people could vote? Is James Madison. So please be aware. The man who is most responsible for the United States Constitution, and please no mistake about this, is James Madison. His proposal is called the Virginia Plan. It is called the Virginia Plan because that is his home state. It will quickly be nicknamed 
the big states plan and this is exactly what Rhode Island was afraid of James Madison proposes a brand new document so we throw out the articles we would make a brand new document ladies and gentlemen yes it will eventually become the Constitution yes the Constitution is very very important yes I will try to go over at least some of it but what is the most basic thing you all need to know is James Madison proposed a brand new government that has separation of three branches legislative executive judicial James Madison argues that what we need to do is we need to create these three branches we separate them and give each one special powers like superheroes you do this you do this you do this and we then create what are called checks and balances ladies and gentlemen the key item here is the United States was debating how do you make a strong government that is not abusive England had a strong government but it abused the articles is what kind of government a weak government but it couldn't it had to have enough power to abuse how do we create a strong government and folks the first thing he came up with is the strength would be the branches the president you know the executive can do this the legislature can do this strong the checks and balances are designed so that no one person can control no one person can abuse each branch is designed to keep the other branches in check that means that the government's job is to basically serve the people use their power, abusing their power why do we call it the big states plan because James Madison did propose that the legislature would be determined by population which is exactly what that's what Rhode Island said was going to happen and clearly population would favor the big states and if you were a small state you would have a huge disadvantage it's kind of like you know today in the House of Representatives what California has 38 people and Alaska and Montana have one a disadvantage right the second plan is going to be called the New Jersey plan it was written by a man named Patterson folks if you're a small state what is the number one thing you want to keep the representation therefore what document would the small states tend to favor the articles right ladies and gentlemen the New Jersey plan is actually a call for amendments they would propose adding taxes adding regulation of commerce maybe even creating a president but what is the main philosophical difference of the New Jersey plan we would keep the articles of confederation we would go to Rhode Island, we would basically make a proposal that Rhode Island could agree with, and of course, what is the number one thing that the New Jersey plan does not want to change? Representation. So that's why they want it. So when you look at the two plans, does everybody understand what two groups of people are fighting? Big and small states by population. Does anybody know what particular issue is creating them? So they're big and small states are fighting, but what famous topic that we've talked about a lot in the last test is the center of the controversy? Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to know the truth, under the articles, we didn't have to worry about taxation. Why? The articles can't tax, right? We realize that doesn't work. The government has to be to tax. The problem is, that goes back to our famous slogan, no taxation. no taxation without representation. So please understand, the big states believe that they deserve more, and the small states say, well, that's not fair. So please understand, when we talk about this, everybody realizes and is not stupid, there are problems in the government. The problem is, is how can you balance that out between the big boys and the small kids? And that's really where the controversy is. The solution. This will be on somewhere. It, this is important. Mrs. Randall's going to talk about this. Anyone ever had in the U.S.? I wouldn't be surprised if Mr. Brown mentioned it in World Cultures. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this is, this is kind of what saves everything. A man named Roger Sherman. And yes, sometimes, and just so no one freaks out, it will sometimes be called Sherman's Compromise. It more commonly is called the Great Compromise. Think about what we had. Ladies and gentlemen, at this moment, we are literally in a standoff between the big and the small. Nobody was willing to compromise. Roger Sherman comes up with a proposal that basically satisfies both. 
It is also referred to as the Connecticut Compromise. Remember how we had Virginia plan, New Jersey plan? Just so nobody freaks out, this is a very, very important item. Don't get it wrong because they use a different name. Connecticut is the state, Sherman is the man, the Great Compromise is the most common nickname. What is the solution? Number one, the Great Compromise proposes adopting the new document. So the Great Compromise actually supports the Constitution, the checks and balances, the separation, the Articles of the Confederation will go the way the dodo bird, right? So we're gonna go with a brand new item. So number one is we will use, I guess, the Virginia plan. Number two, we will take the Congress, because this is really the compromise part. We will take the compromise, or the Congress, and then we will break it between the House and the Senate. The House is meant to represent the people. And that will be determined by population. Clearly, that favors the large states. The Senate is equality. Doesn't matter, same thing today. Alaska has the same amount as California. As, as weird as that may seem, Montana has the same amount as New York. The Senate gets two, the House gets population. So you get, you, it's kind of like you divide it out. Together they make up Congress. What is the item that I think people get confused? These are separate groups. It's not like you take a total vote. What that means is this group has to vote yes, if they vote yes, it goes here, and they have to vote yes. So our Congress is truly bicameral. You have two completely different groups of people, and in order for any bill to become a law, the group that represents the big states must vote yes, and the group that represents all states must vote yes. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the great compromise. Please understand. The Great Compromise adopts a brand new document that will become the Constitution, and it primarily focuses on the issue of representation. Problem number two. So ladies and gentlemen, we, we fixed the big problem. Everybody's happy, we're moving forward, we're writing the document, we're all excited, and all of a sudden we have problem number two. Problem number one is big states, small states. Problem number two is of course you had to get some dipwad to go say, uh, excuse me, is a slave of people. And as I say that, what all of a sudden becomes the exceedingly important issue here? All of a sudden, your population counts, right? Does the state want a bigger or smaller population? The states below the Mason-Dixon line, that would be the Chesapeake. Do you guys all understand that most of those states, about half of their total population was if they are not people, their population is then lower, and they would have less power in the House. The House. Therefore, who would have more influence over Congress? No, no, no. What part of the country? North. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, think about the stupidity of this. Victoria was telling you. When the issue of slavery, the North is yelling what? Slaves are? Property. Think about this. Slaves are property. Slaves are property. They're pieces of property. That's all they are. And the South is going to argue? No, 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 no. They're people. Think about how dumb this is. The South needs to convince them as people because if not, the South population is going to be exceedingly small. The North will control Congress. And if they control Congress, what kind of crazy laws could they make? No slavery. Slavery go bye-bye. And as stupid and dumb as that may sound, you might as well get it in your head now. Remember how we had the three regions? Pretty soon there's going to be how many regions? Not one. And what will they be? There will be north and south. It is coming. Our country is going to divide. And it's not just do you have a slave. Slaving is a byproduct of what? Why do they have slaves? Hardcore agriculture. And the North is going to begin to start adapting and looking at what? Industry. Industry. Trade. What is good for merchants in trade may not be good for farmers. What is good for farmers may not be good for merchants and traders. Who will make those decisions for a country? The Congress. 
Does everybody see why this is a big deal? Ladies and gentlemen, representation equals power. The more representation you have, the more power you have to influence the future. I want to be very clear. When we bring up slavery at the Philadelphia Convention, is this a morality issue? Is this an ethical issue? Heck no. What are they fighting over? They are fighting over power in the United States Congress. Nobody is arguing slaves are people. No arguing, let's abolish. That's not the conversation. The conversation is, what do they count as? Will it make the southern population bigger or small? After arguing, fighting, debate, the South threatening to walk out, we come up with the three-fifth compromise. Ladies and gentlemen, this is huge. Big, ginormous. Because this is about to be written into what? Ladies and gentlemen, now when you say it, first of all, for this moment, it deals with what problem? It deals with, wait, what problem? Representation, especially in the South, for slavery. You take your slave population and three-fifths of it comes towards your population. So, wait, does everybody understand that? Ladies and gentlemen, what is the problem with this as we move forward in our class? Ladies and gentlemen, as of this moment, the word slave is now in the highest document, the law of the land. As we move forward, it basically means you cannot make a law to get rid of slavery. The only way to do it would be you would need an, a, an amendment, which are much, much harder. 